All right, so I'll start the, re <coughs> the recording, okay? Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to lecture 29 of quantum mechanics 2. So uh, thank you all for coming on Saturday afternoon. I hope that this is going to be a more interesting uh, so your and, voice uh, is breaking in case my voice is break okay let me just disconnect my my phone and try one second. okay is it better now hello yes sir uh, we can am hear I, you but I occasionally the, all the voice cuts off when it lags okay i'll try to speak more slowly than i guess I'll try to Sir, uh, we couldn't hear anything after I'll try to. At least turn somebody turn your video on. Na? Otherwise, how can I see your reactions and, and gauge what you can hear or you can't hear? Everybody heard that, I guess, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, we are going to be working with uh, Python and Anaconda um, and uh, with, so let me, and uh, let me just uh, start, I guess, share screen. I guess that's enough. Okay, so you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So the first thing we do is uh, we fire up our um, something called Jupyter. Okay, so if you don't have Jupyter notebook or Python installed, uh, well, you should, you should install them. If you have difficulties installing these on your local machines, uh, there are very nice um, free uh, setups available online. One of one which I know of is Google, Google Colab. Right. So all you have to do there is you just have to log in and. Uh, uh, you will be able to start uh, using. So, let's see which one. Which one should I open? Okay. Okay. So when you open up uh, a Jupyter notebook, it looks like this, right? It opens up in your um, wherever. So, for instance, I started in this directory uh, this is my root directory so it shows the file browser with the contents of this root directory right and uh, now what i want is as i said i python notebooks and, and Okay, so let me first um, give you an idea of, of what uh, we are going to do today by showing you uh, an example of a notebook. So these, these are called these are called notebooks in Python. Again, um, Aditya, since your video is on, if at any point uh, you're having difficulty in um, uh, hearing my voice, 
uh, please uh, just like raise your hand or your finger like this or say something like this so that, okay? Yes, sir. All right, great. So, so th this is, this is uh, the notebook and uh, no, these notebooks are very nice because first of all, you can do both uh, coding and also you can use these notebooks for taking notes because that's, you know, and the best part is you can write uh, LaTeX in, in, in these, in these uh, files. So, uh, can you raise your hands if, if you are all familiar with uh, the concept of uh, Jupyter Notebooks? Okay. So is anybody else other than Aditya familiar with what a Jupyter Notebook is? Ashutosh, Bhartend, Pooja, Shobhoj, Putsa, Varsha. Have you guys ever used a Jupyter Notebook before or not? No, sir. No, okay. No. All right. Uh, I've used it only once. You have used it once, okay. So- Yes, sir, I do. I also have used it once. Okay, that's fine. Great. Uh, so, so what, what you have to do is you have to uh, this will not be as much fun as it should be. Yes, voice breaking up, Aditya. And now it's fine. It was breaking. Thanks. Thanks. See, I need uh, somebody to you know on the other end. So what I'm saying is that unless if you don't have Python installed, you're going to have less fun in this class than you should. Um, so you install Anaconda Python. Anaconda is a particular distribution of Python. There are several distributions of Python, but Anaconda is one of the most popular ones. And then uh, in that distribution, there is a module which is known as Jupyter, G-U-P-Y-T-E-R, Jupyter. So this is this, when you execute this, on your computer and then you come to that server in your local browser. So you see here localhost 8888. So I'm connected to the server on my computer. Yes, what's up? Your voice just broke. I couldn't hear you clearly. I don't know what to tell you guys, man. Network. Okay, just one second. Okay, uh, so I'm using a, a different network. Please let me know if, if my voice is breaking up on this network. Okay, is it clear now, Aditya? Yes, sir. Okay, so you are connecting to uh, this server a local machine, right? So this is local host, that means a local machine, 8888, that's just a, something called a port number. And then this, this, the rest of the URL is just the location of that a notebook. So again, I won't go into great detail about the uh, Jupyter notebook itself uh, because that will take a lot of time. So what I'm going to do is I, I, I'm going to assume that all of you know Python. Is anybody that not know Python? Is there anybody, is, does everybody know Python? Okay, I'll assume that that's the case, okay? So this is some code that I wrote long time back. And uh, in this, I'm using a module which is known as Qtip to do the, the quantum mechanics part. And I use matplotlib, which anybody on, uh, is familiar with, which is which I use that for for plotting, for making 
pictures of of my uh, lattices because what I do in this in this notebook is that as it says lattices, right? Then NumPy for calculations with with vectors and arrays, and Network X. So Network X is a very nice, beautiful library for making graphs. And uh, a lattice is is a graph, right? So that's what uh, I'm doing here. So when you have this is this is called a code cell. It contains code. Uh, this is uh, called a markdown cell. Markdown. So this is in markdown format. So if you click enter, you can see that uh, I have written hashtag. When you press shift enter, that executes the cell. And it translates the hash the hash symbol translates into one. So you, you have to look into the format of markdown files to understand this. It's very beautiful and very convenient for taking it. So I execute this first cell to import these libraries. Right? So you saw there was a little asterisk here that showed up. Uh, that means the cell is executing. So this little asterisk shows up. That means the cell is executing. It's important. Done. And then this last command, you see with percent, there's a percent sign, percent mat dot lip in line. What this does is, uh, it tells the notebook server that if I make any plots using matplotlib, they should be shown within the notebook itself in a separate window. And then just some. Now, uh, let me quickly just show you uh, what happens. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm just testing out an example of making a very simple graph. So a graph in Python uh, can be made using uh, this library, Network X. And here in this line, I have said import Network X as NX. So when you say as something, that means it, when you import it, you can uh, use NX to uh, access the subroutines in that in that library, right? Rather than writing network X every time. So here, for instance, I'm saying that G is equal to NX dot grid graph. And I'm saying two, okay? So grid graph just is a convenience command which generates, as it says, a grid of containing uh, this many points. So here I've given it a one dimensional array, two. Right, so it creates a, a one-dimensional array, and the, the number two tells it that there are two sides. And the next one is nx dot draw that plots the array. Okay, so if you want to, uh, make a two-dimensional graph, a two-dimensional grid, all you have to do is specify a two-dimensional array. Right, and this was a two by three uh, graph, right? Uh, then the rest of it is just me playing around with network X. Then I have a, I, I define a class. So in a Python, you, you is an object oriented language. You can do object oriented programming. You can define objects and classes. Now. There's just on a minor note, uh, there is a language called Julia that is becoming increasingly popular, especially for technical computing these days. And I've looked a lot into Julia. It has a lot of advantages compared to Python, but I think it has some very important disadvantages also. One of those is that it doesn't have any concept of object-oriented programming. So you can't really like do code encapsulation. Code encapsulation means that, for instance, I've created a class here, 
So all the code is within this class. So when I want to use this code, what I do is I, okay, that's a lot of code there. What I do is I, okay, I create another class. Uh, again, lots of code there. So when I want to use this code, what I do is I, I initiate, I create an object. I create an object by using the name of the class and giving it some arguments. So I get this object here, L-A-T-T. It is a certain lattice of certain size with a certain Hamiltonian defined on the lattice. And this just tells me whether the lattice is periodic or not. All of this code, by the way, is on GitHub. So uh, you can access, you can find it there. So what happens is that if I want to access any object of uh, this class, so I have this object, right? And if I want to access any of the variables, I can use this notation. I can say L-A-T-T lat dot ham off what this shows me right is it shows me the hamiltonian associated with this system right then i can say something like lat dot set random state which as the uh, name suggests it initializes my lattice in a random random quantum state and this draws my lattice so this, so these these are the things that you can do with uh, uh, so, so in each one of these lines, I know that I'm working with this object lat. The thing with Julia is that there is no concept of object-oriented programming. So all of these functions, set random state, uh, ham op, everything, these would all be global functions and you would have to pass an object called lat to it as a parameter. So in terms of organizational, uh, and, and being able to organize your code and to think in, modu in a modular manner, uh, it becomes difficult, I think, in Julia because of this reason. So, of course, Julia, like I said, has a lot of advantages. And those of you, uh, since you are all young and have lots of time, might want to sit down and uh, spend some time understanding that language. Now, let me just uh, give you a very quick illustration of what this code can do. Okay, and this code is not working. The reason it's not working is because I've not updated it in a long time uh, and the libraries have changed. Uh, so let me see if there is any, any graphs. Graphs should be there once. Okay, the graphs are also not. Okay, never mind. So what I'll do is I'll open a new notebook. Second, and show you how to work with um, this thing. New and uh, e Python. So we'll see how to work with, with Q-tip and how we can define quantum states, quantum operators, and uh, do all the usual manipulations with them, okay? And then when you have free time, you can go to GitHub and download my code and uh, try to see what is going on. So what I've done here is used all of those Q-tip modules to model, uh, a lattice, many body quantum system. Okay. So using Q tip, right? So let's see. Let's do that. Import Q-tip, it's working right. Q-U-I-T-I. 
Qtip has a simple command called get, and for some reason, autocomplete is not working. Uh, it's really annoying. Um, so you have a command called get, and let's see what get can do. So in Python, if you want to see what a function can do, you put a question mark, and then you put the name of the function, and then you press execute. So what get does is it, as the words, as the name suggests, it creates a vector. Uh, a cat vector, right? And uh, you can uh, you can give it give it a name, well, and then you can give it some some size. Okay. Let's let's look at how this works. Um, One second. What you have to do is ah, okay, like this. Sir. So let's say I want to. Right. So if I say get quote unquote zero. It gives me this vector, right? The first element is one, the second element is zero. Get one, zero, one, right? Now what happens if I write get, uh, get two, right? What if I put a different integer? What will that do? That will not give me anything, okay? Because uh, I have, uh, specified only one integer here. And if there's only one integer, the possible values are zero and one. Those are because there are two eigenstates, right? What happens if I say zero, zero? So if I say zero, zero, then that what, what that means is that now I'm talking about a two dimensional, uh, Hil sorry, uh, Hilbert space of two particles. So this first zero refers to the first part system and a second zero refers to the second system. So it gives me a tensor product state. This is get zero, zero. This is exactly what you have when you take, so get zero, tensor, get zero. Similarly, get zero, one, right? Then get uh, one, zero, and get one one right so because if you remember for a system which is a tensor product of uh, two sp uh, spin one half particles your total dimensionality is four right and your basis elements are zero 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 one one zero and one one right so what what this is doing is generating the corresponding states okay and just as you can have uh, the generate the catch states, you can also generate the the corresponding bra objects, right? And uh, then you have uh, uh, this thing dot. one second right so you can you know that the what is the relationship between a bra object and a cat object they are hermitian adjoints of each other right 
So the Hermitian adjoint is represented by the method DAG, short for dagger, right? So here I've created a cat zero, zero. And when I take, apply the dagger operation, it gives me the problem, right? And if I apply the dagger operation again, I should get the get of get uh, back, right? So that's what I, I I see. Okay, great. Now I want to define um, operators, right? So how do I how do I define operators? Let me just go back and uh, quickly refer to this. Um, Right. So the way to define operators is you can use, so for instance, you have the poly matrices, right? For a two dimensional system. What are the poly matrices? Sigma X, right? So there is a command called Sigma X. So if I write down Sigma X, what this does is, you can see that it has the components which I expect the poly X matrix to have, right? One, one in the off type. Sigma Y, right? One complex mi minus I and plus I, Sigma Z, one minus one, right? Now, what, so let's say that I have a state, okay? And I want to write my state as some superposition of uh, an up state and a down state, okay? And so I have some uh, parameters, let's say I call it something alpha. Um, let me say alpha is, is three and beta is equal to four. And then I say state is equal to three into get zero, right? Uh, the the up state and three into cat uh, sorry not p alpha into cat zero and beta into cat one okay what do I get right I get this cat one now this is obviously not normalized right so I want to normalize it. Uh, Again, without autocomplete, things become a little bit different. Difficult. Normalize is not just one second. Uh, uh, just let me quickly fix uh, this uh, Jupyter autocomplete problem. This is a recent bug that has shown up in, in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and I haven't fixed it on my machine yet. Right. So I have to put this command here. Okay. Now you will see that autocomplete is working, right? And life becomes much nicer after autocomplete is working. Because the moment I type S, it shows me a pop-up of all the things which begin with x, right? So state dot, and these are all the methods which can act on, on the state, right? Eigen energies, eigen states, uh, is Hermitian, is cat, right? All of, all of these other different objects. State dot unit, right? What this does is, so what does this, Okay. One second. So what this does is this normalizes the state. 
right and normalization what what, what is normalization that is it takes these this alpha and beta it takes the components it squares them adds them right divided by the total magnitude so here you will get 3 by 5 and here you will get 4 by 5 3 by 5 is 0.6 and 4 by 5 is 0.8 so this is our normalized state right so i'll write state is equal to state dot unit and state okay 0 0.6 0 0.8 great so i can define my um my my states now what about my operators okay so as i showed you earlier you can do you already have these predefined uh objects sigma x sigma y and sigma z but if you want to you can explicitly assign uh the matrix elements right so you can use any n by n matrix to define an operator so I'll say ham, and now what is an example of um, of of a Hamiltonian, right? So let's think about the Hamiltonian of a particle in a magnetic field. What does that look like? And now I'll show you how LaTeX works. Okay, so. Dollar dollar. C dot. Right. So what is this? One second. Uh, Yeah, okay. This is what I mean. Okay, great. So this is a this is an example of a of a Hamiltonian of a particle in a magnetic field. B is a vector, right? Which has components b x, b y, b z. This represents, for instance, the components of an external magnetic field, right? Sigma i of poly matrices. So it's a vector of poly matrices: sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, right? And the Hamiltonian of your particle. Is simply b dot sigma, right? Now, if we make the assumption that this vector b uh, it points entirely in the z axis, right? So let's say that that means x and y components are zero, and uh, it only has a z component, right? Then what will happen? Your Hamiltonian will simply become a product of your z component of your uh, right uh, magnetic field and sigma z okay so what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll define a variable bz okay let's call that point one uh, give it a value point one and then our hamiltonian is simply bz times uh, the function Sigma Z. Okay. 
and now what are the eigen states and eigen values well that's easy because we have ham ham is our operator right so let's just look at this ham again once again what is it it's 0.1 multiplied by sigma z so it's between 0.1 and minus 0.1 right so this is a very simple system nothing too complicated going on here uh and whenever you define a hamiltonian or anything you should always check if it's permission so you can use this command check permission to just to make sure uh that and let's ask what are the eigen energies right so the eigen energies of the hamiltonian well you can just read them off will be 0.1 and minus 0.1 and ham dot eigen states right so ham dot eigen states gives you an array of two vectors so let me uh, uh put this in a different variable um um let me call that states okay and then what is states so i can say type states so this command in python tells me what kind of a variable uh an object is so this is a tuple right what is a tuple a tuple is like an array uh and i can access the elements of the array so or or the tuple so let's see how what is the length of this array going to be it's going to be 2 because i'm going to have two vectors how do i access them i access them like this so states this is the first vector and you can see this is just minus z.1 and point, point 0.1 and then states one uh so this is the uh the second um okay one second sorry states one right uh states okay hold on one second uh how one okay yeah so these are my these are my two eigen states this is the first eigen state so states and then this is my second eigen state right now um so this is simple right but what if i have something more complicated let's say i have a system of of two particles right and i want to construct the hamiltonian for that system so what will be the form of the hamiltonian first of all let's just write down the map okay so our hamiltonian will look like this you will have the magnetic field right which will act on each side separately right so you will get uh, this vector b uh, dot uh, sigma 1 right but now if you remember whenever you have more than one particle your operators are all have to live in the tensor product space so your operators have to look like this right what does this notation tell you it tells you that you are taking the vector b and acting on uh so i'll make this sigma sigma z 
sigma z is on the first side and identity on the second side right so this is for this is but this is only one term right now we need one more term just like this but with uh the identity first and then a sigma z four times okay so it's not the code sorry not the code uh, the symbol right so this is my hamiltonian for a system of two parts okay and again what i'm saying is that there is a magnetic field here i have assumed that the magnetic field is the same you could also have a situation where the magnetic field changes from point to point in which case instead of having uh uh b here i would just have let's say b1 and b2 right okay b1 and b2 i have two different vectors and uh one more correction since uh, i should write vector sigma and vector oops okay okay now how can i uh construct this in q tip how can i construct an operator like this so um what i want is this tensor this operator right how do how do, where where do i get this operator from well it's already present in q tip in the form of the command tensor okay so for instance if i want to take the tensor product of two sigma z matrices i just say tensor sigma z sigma z. what do i get i get a 4 by 4 matrix okay if i uh want to take uh the identity matrix i say identity 2 right and now look at the first component the first component is sigma tensor identity right and we'll work with sigma z only for simplicity so the first component of that hamiltonian can be written as sigma z tensor sigma z comma identity 2 this is the first component of my hamiltonian right and you don't have to work it out all by hand it's much faster when you do it here the second component will look like the first component but only with the order of the elements reverse okay and now what is my total hamiltonian going to be so first let me define uh two variables b1 and b2 just to indicate the two different magnetic fields at the two locations and then my hamiltonian is uh b1 times this plus b2 times this right this this is what i get for my hamiltonian now i can ask what are the eigen energy and this is a diagonal hamiltonian there is not much going on okay this is a diagonal hamiltonian so the eigen energy is all over the east but this is just a just an example uh, in the state and the eigen states uh, will also be very very straight forward 1 1 1 1 okay so you can use this kind of procedure to build as complicated a hamiltonian as you like okay let me uh, show you an example of 
what sort of a Hamiltonian one can construct. Hubbard. Hubbard model. So as an example, I'll show you something called the Hubbard model. The Hubbard model is a very, very important uh, um, Hamiltonian, which is, is used in, in, in many body physics and connect matter systems. And I will I will explain what the various terms in this in all of this what they mean. Okay. So this is this is what the Hubbard model looks like, and what what are what what is going on here? The Hubbard model represents electrons which live on a well, they can live on a one-dimensional or two-dimensional lattice. Here, for you know, I'm working with. Uh, you can work with whatever you want. So, it is a sum of three different operators. Now, what are these operators? The first operator is this object C, right? And there's a subscript J and sigma. J denotes the lattice site. So, for each lattice site, you will have a separate set of operators, C operators. These are creation and annihilation operators. Sigma represents the spin. So if I write C I up dagger, what that means is I'm talking about the creation operator for the i side, right? For the up spin, up uh, spin. So if I act on my, on my vacuum state, and what is my vacuum state? It's zero, zero, zero. There is nothing. All my sites are empty. If I act on my vacuum state with, let's say, C3 up spin dagger, what this will do is it will create a single up spin excitation at the third site of my lattice. If I act with the C3 down spin dagger, you know, it will create a down spin. And this one is the annihilation operator, right? So if there is an excitation, it will remove that corresponding excitation. Now, what does this, this operator do? So for the time being, you can ignore the index sigma. You can assume that your particles don't have any spin. You can just work with CI uh, dagger and CI. So what, what, what does this, the action of this kind of an operator do? If you act on any state, the first operator is, is, is the annihilation operator for the jth site, right? So it says that if there is an excitation on the jth site, this operator will annihilate that excitation. This operator says that on the i-th side, it will create an excitation, right? So what is the net effect of both of, of these operators acting in this way? Can anybody tell me? They conserve the number of particles. Hmm? They conserve the number of particles. Well, no, no, I'm not asking what is conserved. I'm asking what is the effect of... Uh... Transferring the excitation. Hmm? It transfers the excitation. It, it just moves a particle from one point to another point. Right? So this is called a hopping element. It's called a hopping element. And also this represents the kinetic energy of the system. So there's a parameter T here. The strength of the parameter measures the kinetic energy of your particles. <clears throat> and to be completely correct, this should all, there should also be a Hermitian conjugate uh, added to this. Hermitian conjugate of this term added to the 
whole expression, uh, which is not here. Then you have these other terms. What these terms represent is what is n? n is the number operator, right? What is the number operator? Can anybody tell me what is the number operator for a harmonic oscillator? Ashutosh? Yeah, Ashutosh? What, yes, is number, what is the number operator? Do you remember? No, no sir. K dagger A. Huh? Is it is it coming back now? Maybe. What what does A dagger A do? A dagger A tells you uh, what is the state right, in which your uh, harmonic oscillator lives, right? So it measures the number of excitations. Now we are dealing with fermions here. So you can only have either one fermion or zero fermions on the side. Okay. You can't create more than that. So your number operator can only have eigenvalue zero or one. What does this, what does this term do? This term creates a potential energy. This term creates an on-site potential energy. And there's a repulsion between uh, the electron when the, the if you so if you have a single electron, if you have it at one side, uh, how many electrons can you have? In one state, how many electrons can you have? Yukta? So only one? Only one. Why not two? According to Pauli's theorem. Pauli's exclusion principle, right? So what does Pauli's exclusion principle say? In that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in one uh, orbital, uh, there will be only one electron with uh, all four uh, NLM. Uh, right with all with all the values of n l m right so in this case we don't have orbitals we don't have to worry about l and all but i'm saying now the electron has a spin also no so if i electrons can be in spin up and spin down then how many electrons can i have at a single at a single side um karthik No, Kati, it's not mm -hmm. here. Uh, Pooja, how many electrons can ha have in a single state uh, if electrons can have spin up and spin down? Two. Two, right? One can, one can be spin up and the other can be spin down. And this does not violate the exclusion principle because both of them are in different states, right? One, because the spin up state and the spin down state are different from each other. And so this should not be J, this should be I. So this is a small error. Let me fix that. So this term says that if you have two electrons which are sitting on the same side, right, there should be a repulsion between them, which is the Coulomb repulsion, right? And that should increase the energy of the system. So that's why there's a positive term. And then there's a third term. You don't, let's not worry about that term for now. And now let's see how we can create, how can we can use by Q-tip to model such a system, okay? So first of all, what we need is our creation and annihilation operators. So in Q-tip, it's very simple. You just use the command create and you specify the dimensionality of your system. Now you have a, you have spin one half particle, so you have two dimensional Hilbert space. So you say create two. What does this do? This create this generates this matrix, right? This is a creation operator. Similarly, I can ask 
what is the destruction operator, right? Now, creation and annihilation operators, uh, they have some permutation relation, right? So I can ask whether or not these creation and annihilation operators satisfy those commutation relations. So how do I do that? Well, I just ask, uh, right? I just take the, the operators and calculate the commutator, right? What is the commutator? Right, this is the commutator, right, of any two operator. So I just calculate this. Now you see, I get, I don't get the identity now. So let me try something else. I try plus. Okay, so I'll do that on a separate line, and I'll tell you why I'm why I'm doing the plus sign in one second. Right. So when I do it with a plus sign, I get the identity. So what's going on here? Right. This is funny. So first, let me write down the code, the corresponding uh, LaTeX expression. It looks like this. Right. What is this object that I've written here? This is called the anti-commutator. So this is the commutator with square brackets and a minus sign. This is the anti-commutator. It got a plus sign and curly brackets. So we can see that these creation and annihilation operators, they satisfy anti-commutation relations, not the commutation relations, right? And why is that? The reason is because my particles are fermions. Okay, they are not they are not bosons. So for fermions, I have to uh, my fermions have to satisfy anti-commutation relations, right? And the, there's a another way to see that, which is the which is the fact that uh, if I take create two and multiply it with itself, what should I get? I get zero. Why is that? Because what does create to do? Create, create creates a single particle. But then if I apply the creation operator again, right, I should get zero. Why? Because I can't have two particles at the same place, right? So I get zero. So these are fermions. Okay. Now I want to write down the Hamiltonian. I want to write down the Hamiltonian for this, this uh, system here. Okay, how do I do that? First, I want to define my creation and annihilation operators for the full system. How do I do that? Well, I, if I want to define the creation operator for the J site, what is that? It is the identity operator acting on all the sites up till J minus one then cj dagger the creation operator and then again the identity operator acting on all the remaining sites okay so i've written some code here for that what does this code do def create n so this is how you write a function in python and create n and it takes some uh, optional variable so the first variable tells me which uh, which site I want to uh, the operator for. N tells me how many total number of sites I have, and this tells me what is the dimensionality of my site Hilbert space, right? So by default, my site Hilbert space is two dimensional. Okay. So how do I create this? How do I write this in terms of Cupid code? Uh, Q tip, Q tip, not. Q so first of all, I have my dagger operator, 
right? And since I'm going to be using the same matrix, I initialize it once by saying create dims. So here dims is two dimensions. So this creates a single matrix. And similarly, this makes a sim single matrix for the uh, annihilation operator. This is the identity matrix. Okay. Now I take a list, I make a list of N objects. Okay, so this is an array. It will contain n objects. Okay. So first of all, what do I do? I take this empty list, this empty array, and I add to it the identity operator using this kind of an expression. This is called list comprehension in Python. So when I say for n in range capital N. Right, capital N. So if, for example, let's say N is equal to four, then this small variable N will go from uh, zero, one, two, three, right? And in C list, I will add in each uh, element, each element will be one identity operator, okay? But now, I want to put the creation operator somewhere, right? Where do I want to put the creation operator? I want to put it in the i side. So I want to put it, the creation operator, let's say in the first side. Now in Python, array numbers go from zero to n minus one. So the first side corresponds to array uh, number zero, array index zero. So I say C list i minus one, right? Because the Python indexing because of Python array indexing, I have a minus one. And I say that this element is equal to C that the creation of it. So all the other elements are the identity, right? So I have an array of N elements. Each element is an identity matrix. The ith element is my creation operator. And then all the remaining elements are again the identity matrix. Right? And then I want to make, what do I want to do? I want to take the tensor product of all of these operators. Right? So I can use this command tensor C list. What, what this does is, so you can give this command a list of operators and it will just take the tensor product of all of the elements of the list, okay? So here, for instance, uh, in, the other in the other file, where is that? Here I had shown you uh, that I had shown you how to take the, let's say the tensor product of two, two operators and I passed them separately as arguments but you can also pass a list. And when you pass a list, it will uh, take each element of the list and apply the tensor product to all of them. Okay, so this is my code. Now let's see what this code does. Uh, okay, this is the simplest case. The simplest case is n is equal to one. That means you have one side. Okay, nothing, sim nothing will happen there. You will just get the ordinary creation operator. So let's see something else. Let's see something slightly more interesting. Let's say n is equal to three, you have three sides and I put the creation operator at the second side. Now for three sides, what will be the dimensionality of a Hilbert space, uh, Pooja? Sorry, sir, I didn't, I didn't get you. I have a, I have three lattice sites. Each site has a spin one and a half particle. What is the total dimensionality of the Hilbert space? Oh. Hmm? It will be. Oh, eight. Eight. Right? So I get an eight by eight dimensional matrix. 
okay so what is this matrix this matrix is uh, you can also write it as tensor uh, identity 2 create 2 identity 2 like this this will give me the same object right but i have made an, made a little small code for it so i can put in uh, i don't have to you know do the i, I can just put in some numbers and to generate the operator for me. Okay. Similarly, in exactly the same way, you can make the destroy operator. So I have destroy in a little bit of code here. Fine. And then I have number in, which does the same thing. In fact, I don't need <laughs> three different functions. I could just have defined one function which says operator n which puts any operator, I have to pass the operator as an argument, right? And it and it creates the identities, tensor identities, then tensor operator, and then tensor identity. Anyways, now I'm in a position to create my Hubbard Hamiltonian, okay? So I've given it some parameters, n is equal to 10, so I'm taking my lattice size to be 10. E is equal to one, the kinetic energy I'm taking to be one, u potential energy is one. This mu chemical potential, I'm taking it to be zero so that you can ignore the last term in that Hamilton. Okay. And then what does the rest of this code do? The rest of this code, what it does is it, it creates this Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian you have here, it creates this Hamiltonian. How does it do that? Right? Let's look at one of these terms. Okay? One of these terms, so this is a sum over all nearest neighbors. Right? So when I write h is equal to slash sum, uh, I J I C J. Right. When I write this expression, what this what does this 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 sum mean? This sum means sum over all nearest neighbors in my lattice. So, if my lattice consists of two points. Right, there are just two points. What will my Hamiltonian look like? My Hamiltonian will look like this C dagger one, C two, plus C dagger two, C one. Right, I have two sides. My hopping term can take an electron from the first side to the second side or from the second side to the first side. That's the only possibility, right? So how do I, uh, how do I generate this kind of a Hamiltonian now? What do I do? First, I have to generate the operator C1. Then I have to generate the operator C2 and then I have to multiply those two operators. So you, do, you see, it's not a very trivial procedure. It's, it's actually quite a, quite a complicated procedure because to generate a single operator, I have to take all of these tensor products, right? See, if you don't do this, you will not capture the quantum mechanics of the problem. You will just reduce the problem to a, a classical mechanical problem if you don't take tensor products. So that's what my, my code here does, right? And I explaining all of this will take too long, so I, I won't do that, okay? And as an example, this is the Hamiltonian. So this is a 10 by 10, this is a 10 dimensional lattice. So what is the dimensionality of the Hamiltonian going to be? It's going to be 64 by 64, right? And there are some parameters, and this is my Hamiltonian. Now I can ask what are the eigen energies. I can ask what are the eigenstates, right? 
and this is the this is the eigenstate uh, ground right so if i say sorry if i say ground zero this will give me an array a 64 dimensional array right and this gives me the ground state but okay not terribly enlightening so let's see what 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 sort of information do we want to extract from the hamiltonian so let's let's go back up here this is a hamiltonian what can we do with the hamiltonian well for a quantum mechanical system or for a classical mechanical system what one does is when you have a system of many objects many 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 particles you use statistical techniques to study the system okay so so that is called statistical mechanics either quantum statistical mechanics or classical statistical mechanics now in statistical mechanics what you say is that the, the, the system has a probability of being in a certain state, right? And the probability of being in a certain state is given by something called the Boltzmann probability, right? Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, he was this person who invented thermodynamics, most of it. And that probability is given by exponential of minus beta h. Now, have any of you in your engineering courses seen such an expression in any of your thermodynamics courses? Exponent minus h by kt. Have you heard of the Boltzmann probability in your engineering courses? Aditya? Have you heard of the Boltzmann probability before? No, sir. Huh? No, sir. No. Toboj? No. In our thermodynamics course, that's it. Just mentioned. Huh? It was just mentioned in our thermodynamics course, that's it. Okay. Yeah, that's why I say that engineering courses. Suck. I mean, seriously, like if you if you if they if they don't explain talk about Boltzmann probability, then I don't know what they're teaching. Anyways, so uh this is called the Boltzmann distribution, right? This is the probability that your system is going to be in a particular state. And now in the quantum mechanical case, this becomes an operator, right? Because H is an operator, you're taking the exponential of an operator, right? So this, this whole thing becomes an operator. And then you define something called a partition function, which is the trace of this operator, right? And how do you find the trace of any operator? Does anybody remember what it means to find the trace? What star do you remember what it means to find the trace of an operator? Some of diagonal elements. Some of the diagonal matrix elements, yes. right? So you take the matrix element, how do you find the matrix elements of the operator? You sandwich it between different states. Let's say alpha here, this is one state and this could be another state bit. Then the trace is just the sum over setting alpha is equal to beta, right? This quantity. This quantity is called the partition function. The partition function encodes all the thermodynamic information about the system. Okay. So I have defined the Hamiltonian, the quantum mechanical object, right? Uh, I, I can find its, uh, what do you call it? Eigenstates and eigenenergies, right? And then, uh, okay, so the rest of this uh, doesn't really refer to one second. Uh, Okay, so 
so what happens now? Okay, the, so the rest of it requires a little bit of theory, uh, which I won't go into in great detail. But I'll just tell you what the result is. That if you take this Hubbard model for a single site, and for a single site, obviously the system is very, very oversimplified, but even that can tell you a lot. And for a single site, you can calculate the partition function explicitly. You get this, this kind of a expression. Okay. And then you can ask, uh, you can make a plot of different, different, what are these plots of? Um, right, so this is a plot, for instance, of the, of the partition function for different values of this parameter mu, right? And, uh, well, this doesn't really have anything to do with Q-tip as such, so I'll, I'll, I'll not worry about it. Okay, so now I've given you some idea of how to make these operators in Hamiltonian with Q-tip. Let me just go to show, show you some of the code samples from the Q-tip website. Okay, so the best way to learn this obviously is to go online and look at the, the manual. Right, the manuals are very uh, quite uh, comprehensive. Okay, so everything that I've talked about, tensor products and so on and so forth, all of that is written here. So here is an example of constructing a composite Hamiltonian, right? So this is a composite Hamiltonian for a system of two coupled qubits. Qubits meaning spin one half particles. There are two particles. And the Hamiltonian is given by a coupling between them, which looks like this, sigma x tends to sigma x. Right, so how do you create the Hamiltonian for this? First of all, you have the uh, kinetic energy part. The kinetic energy part for an, a single uh, this thing spin is just the sigma z. Okay, that just measures whether your system is, is in spin up or spin down. So you take tensor sigma z identity, then tensor identity sigma z. This constructs your uh, kinetic and or, or your uh, yeah kinetic energy part. Well, not kinetic energy. Uh, The energy of your uh, of your of your electrons due to the due to their magnetic dipole moment, and then you have a part here which which takes tensor sigma x sigma x. This is your interaction. You say print edge, you get a four by four matrices. What about three qubits? Again, the same process. But now sigma z identity, identity tensor, right? So you see that you have to do lots of tensoring. So it helps to write convenience subroutines which can do this. And for three qubits, this interaction, how do I write this sigma x by sigma x term? This, this is the one in which you have to be a little bit careful. So up till here, these are all the sigma z, the, uh, the site energies, we don't worry about that too much. So let's look at this, this expression here. What is this expression doing? It's taking tensor of sigma x, sigma x, and then identity. So this, this one is creating the uh, interaction between the first site and the second site, right? And then you will have one more term which involves the interaction between the second site and the third site, that's it. Take the output, you get some eight by eight matrix. Great. Right. So in this way, you can you can you can create these these Hamiltonians. Now, that's wonderful. Uh, but what we would like to do, for instance, is we would like to 
uh, one of the things we would like to do is look at dynamics, right? So what is what is dynamics? How how do we get dynamics of quantum system? We get dynamics by solving the solving the what? The what? Ashutosh? Yes, sir. Dynamic comes from where? Dynamics of a quantum state? Collapse. Uh, collapse, but before collapse, there has to be what? Measurement. Before, before measurement, there has to be evolution, no? Yes, sir, evolution. Evolution is generated by what? Uh, when uh, any um, um, state is acted upon some the Schrodinger equation yes sir the Schrodinger equation tells you how the state evolves in time right so we want to solve the Schrodinger equation now it turns out that uh, doing a brute force solution of the Schrodinger equation is not necessarily uh, the very, very easy to do. So there are all kinds of other methods. Uh, one of those methods is called the Monte Carlo method. And again, uh, I won't talk about that. Talking about that will require a whole different um, session. So this is what the Schrodinger equation looks like, right? H bar H acting on psi is equal to this quantity, right? And, and how do we calculate, uh, how do we solve this? If we solve this, what, what, what happens is we get psi of t. What you do is you take this dt over to the right-hand side and ih bar over to the right-hand side. And then you integrate both sides. So you, on the left side, you get integral of d phi or d psi. On the right side, you get integral of, and sorry, you take the psi and you bring it here. So you get integral of d psi by psi. And on the right side, you get integral of h dt. Right? And then on the left side, you get log of psi, you take the exponential of both sides, and then finally you find that psi of t is equal to exponent of minus i h t, that's your unitary time evolution operator, acting on psi t is zero. Okay? This is for the case where you not have a time dependence. If it has a time dependence, your solution looks a little bit more complicated. It has a similar form. It looks like psi of t is equal to exponential of minus i h bar, but then you have to take h itself as a function of time and integrate it. So if I integral h t dt, and all of that is in the exponent. Right? So how do we uh, do, solve this in, in, in Q-tip, right? So in Q-tip, we can calculate, given a Hamiltonian, we can calculate the unitary. Unitary means non-dissipative. What is the meaning of non-dissipative? No, dissipation means to lose information, to lose energy, right? So unitary evolution does not change the energy of the system. So it's non-dissipative. Time evolution of an arbitrary state vector, psi naught, psi zero using this me solve, okay? As an example, we construct a Hamiltonian. Now this is a very simple Hamiltonian. This is two pi times 0.1 times sigma x. So this Hamiltonian is simply proportional to sigma x, okay? Then psi zero. So I say, what is my initial state? My initial state is, basis two comma zero. So let me copy this code over into our notebook here and execute it and see what, what it does. Okay. Let's copy, paste. Okay, NP is not defined. Uh, didn't I import number? Import 
that's not the okay all right so what is size zero size zero is just a two dimensional state so you i have used another function here basis okay so this is earlier i had used the get uh, function you can also use the basis function then what is this times variable this time is an array of so when you want to do the evolution of any system right you go from some initial time to some final time now in a computational in a in a computer you can't cannot do uh, you don't have infinite accuracy right so you what you do is you divide your time interval into steps and then you calculate the the evolution over each step right so here we take a time interval of 10 right let's say call that 10 seconds do you do there are no units here so this is just 10 units of time divided up into 20 20 intervals okay so we get an array of 20 numbers and then the result is how do you obtain the result you use the one of these solve algorithms you specify the hamiltonian you specify the initial state and you specify the the array of all the times at which you want the result right and then you have one last argument in this function and this argument first of all what is what is the form of this argument you have square brackets so in python square brackets denote an array and inside this array you have a single element which is sigma z right so what is this this uh, this the brackets in the fourth argument is an empty list of collapse operators okay so here is not in, not an empty list right so we are not too worried about the collapse operators at this time um so let's see what happens when i when i run this right it ran very quickly we didn't have to do anything and then i say result dot expect uh sorry expect is not a function it's a okay this gives me some some numbers what are these numbers what do these numbers uh give us so i specified this operator sigma z right here so if i say result dot expect right this is a list of expectation values for the operators that are included in the list in the fifth argument right so this is my fifth argument and uh right sorry so not the fourth argument is the fifth argument and there is a list of operators here here it's sigma z right so this is the expectation value of sigma z calculated in the state at each time step okay uh import um what is it i plot i plot as plt plt sir. thank you <laughs> and then you say plt or is it plt dot plot uh, plt dot plot um okay one second ah this this i need to like one second it's not that I need to get the values out of that properly let me do that result dot expect uh 
Uh, I expect is equal to this, right? And then uh, x is it's one comma twenty. So I want to plot okay, the, the x uh, right. I want to plot this. Let me do that. Then expect zero. Right there we go. This is a plot of the expectation value of sigma z, right? So the y, the x-axis is the time, the y-axis is the expectation value of sigma z, meaning that I have this Hamiltonian, right? And I'm asking what happens to my Sigma Z spin as I apply this Hamiltonian. So what happens is my spin starts off, my, my it, it starts off in the in the up state. The Hamiltonian causes this sigma z to evolve in this manner. First it goes down to minus one. So it just goes down like this, goes down and around. Right? Of course, at each point, there is no actual measurement being performed. Right, we are not collapsing the state. This is, so each data point represents what would happen, what would be the result if you did collapse this, which we are not doing, right? And if you want to make it, uh, make the um, plot a little bit smoother, you just increase your granularity, right? This is signal. Okay. Then you can put in as many operators as you want. So for instance, I can look at sigma z, I can look at sigma y. Right, so I can put in sigma y. Sigma y, these are my two operators, right? And then I have uh, z, z, uh, result dot expect zero, right? So, so z values is equal to result expect dot zero, y values is equal to result. One plot and then uh, right. I want to plot uh, these two. So this is my x coordinate, and then I believe I should be able to do something like this. Z y Will this work? How do I plot multiple y values? Aditya, do you know Sir, I think a figure you need to generate and use that figure to huh? superimpose. Sir, you have to put that plt dot plot command twice and then generate. Say that again. You might need to use that plt dot plot uh, this thing twice and generate a figure. I, I'll just I'll just do it in the uh, in, the, in the way that it's been done here. Okay, I'll, I'll make it. I'll just copy this. Yes, sir. I need to generate a figure and then use that a figure to. Right, 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 right. Great. So this code it, it creates uh, the plot for sigma z and sigma y. So you can see sigma z goes like this, sigma y. Okay, great. And uh, this is 
we have used uh, here we have used this se solve right so what is the se solve uh, function doing uh, it is the schrodinger evolution so se stands for schrodinger evolution okay and then you have something called me solve what is me solve ME solve refers to master equation, okay? So this is used if you have an open system. An open system is a dissipative system, means that it is interacting with the environment. So then you would use some ME solve, okay? And in such a case, you would have non-unitary evolution, right? Now, of course, there's a lot of things to learn here, but I'll just give you a very simple, I'll show you what's going on in this case. Uh, so if you have non-unitary evolution, how do you model it? You say that there is your system Hamiltonian, you have an environment, and then you have an interaction. Okay. And then all of this mathematics, well, I won't explain that right now. There's something called the Lindblad equation. But the main thing is how do we uh, how do we do this any solve? Well, we use the same Hamiltonian from before, the same initial state, psi naught, the same set of times, and the same set of expectation values, sigma. So we want to look at the expectation values of sigma z and sigma y. But now we use ME solve, and ME solve takes another argument, which is this object. Okay, what is this object doing? This is called. This will describe the dissipation of energy from the system. Okay, and so when we execute this, what happens to sigma z and sigma y? Well, you can see that since the system is dissipated now, right, the oscillations are gradually going to die out, right? Now, this, you might say, well, okay, this is all great, but what can I do with it? What, what is a practical possible application? So the practical application is, for instance, in modeling, um, uh, the components of a quantum computer, right? So there, there are quantum computers consist can be you know made in different ways. Uh, they are based on, on on squid devices, which are these quantum superconductors, superconducting quantum interference devices. They can be based on on qubits. Can be you can have photonic qubits. You can have qubits in uh, nitrogen vacancies. Uh, so you so you you have uh, diamonds, and and diamond you can have an impurity, which is called a nitrogen vacancy, and that impurity can be used as a qubit, because you can put it into an up state or a down state by uh, sending in uh, some some photons of certain radiation. Uh, at, at a certain wavelength, right? So qubits can be of all, 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 all different types. And the way you model these qubits is with such Hamiltonians, right? So what you have here, whenever you, whenever you say that you are doing a Hamiltonian evolution, what you are all doing is you are, you are doing a quantum computation, right? And So this is an example of, uh, this is a two level atom. So coupled to a leaky single mode cavity. Okay, so this is, this is a little bit more complicated. I'll have to explain to you what an atom is, what is a cavity and how things are related to that. So I'm not going to go into that, okay? Now let me look at something more, uh, more visual, which is plotting on the block sphere. 
So what is the block sphere? Well, let's have a look at it. This is this is called the block sphere. Okay, and where do you where do we get this picture from? Let me. Uh, work so, right. equal to uh, so let me uh, remind myself what the uh, parameterization I think it looks like this cosine slash theta by two equal zero plus t to the i phi theta by two that is that one okay and let me make it a little bit prettier maybe a bit easier to read testing Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So this is this is called uh, I don't know what the name is. This is a this is a standard parameterization of a of a single qubit. So this is the up state and this is the down state. Okay, zero and one. And theta and phi are two uh, variables which as the choice of symbol suggests, can take theta can take values between zero and pi, right? So theta and phi together, they give you points on the surface of a sphere. Phi tells you the uh, longitude, it goes from zero to 360, and theta tells you the latitude, it goes from zero to 90, right? Now, if you look at this expression, and uh, just let me, make this expression a little bit nicer to look at. When things are nicer to look at, um, yeah, this is slightly nicer, okay? So what happens when theta is equal to zero in this? What, what, what is the value of psi? Well, theta is equal to zero, this term is just zero. And so psi is equal to the ket zero, the up state, okay? So this corresponds to the north pole of the sphere, right? What what happens when uh, theta is equal to, in this case, uh, yeah, when it's equal to 180 degrees, when it's equal to 180 degrees, theta by two is 90. This is zero and you're the, you're talking about the south pole of the sphere. So the south pole of the sphere becomes your down state. So if you look at this, uh, so let's uh, make this plot here. Q-tip uh, in a second. Block 3D. Oh. We need to import some module and all. I don't have that. Never mind. So we'll just look at it here. Right? So this is your sphere. This is a north pole, which corresponds to the up state, and the south pole, which corresponds to the down state. Okay? What about the equator? The equator corresponds to something very interesting. In the equator, you have theta is equal to uh, 90 degree. Right? So cosine, you get 45. Right? Theta by 2 is 45 degrees. You get 1 by root 2, 0, plus 1 by root 2 of 1. But then you have a phase angle. Right? So you get an equally weighted superposition of 0 and 1, but with a relative phase. So if you look at all the points on the equator, right? 
they correspond to the state one plus uh, zero, sorry, ket zero plus ket one, but with a relative phase. And the phase is determined by where you are on the point. Okay. So all the points on this sphere, they represent one, one qubit. The different possible configurations one qubit can, can come in. Okay. So you can you can take any any qubit, and that qubit will correspond to a point on the surface of this sphere. Right. So this is the up state, and uh, so let me look at one. Right. So. What the, the block sphere allows you to do is it allows you to visualize the time evolution of any 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 state under the effect of a Hamiltonian. So, as an example, when we did this uh, this this uh, Schrodinger evolution of our Hamiltonian here, right? We started in uh, the up state, which was psi zero, right? So if you look at the block, if you look at the evolution of the system, it will be a point which starts from zero. And then you, the evolution will trace out a, tra a trajectory on the surface of this sphere, right? And then that trajectory will take you to the down state and then presumably come back up and then go around, right? So you get a visual picture of the dynamics of the state it's not just the expectation value but the actual space okay so this again uh, one one can uh, explore this uh, at leisure at your leisure okay and then there are various uh, tools for ex for visualizing uh, probability distributions of different uh, different states uh, so you you can you, so you need to understand what density matrices are. I haven't really talked about density matrices too much in class, unfortunately. Uh, so again, like I said, I can't explain all of Qtip in a two-hour session. I'm giving you an overview of the possibilities. Uh, the, uh, capabilities of this software. Okay, we can do lots of nice things. Right. So this is Qtip. Now let me quickly show you another uh, system, another Python uh, library which is called Quant. K W A N. Quant stand, stands for quantitative uh, simulations, quantitative numerics. So you can do more uh, more sophisticated things with quant, and we'll just look at a couple of examples. Again, I won't go into detail of um, how to use quant. Okay, so what does quant allow you to do? You have some Hamiltonian. Now you see this is a Hamiltonian of a two-dimensional system, right? You can see this is the Laplacian in two dimensions, and there's a potential. And this potential is a function only of y in this particular case. So what you do, what quant does, you don't have to do any of this, is it discretizes your given Hamiltonian. Discretization in this case means that you take your, your, your system, right, right? So your system is, let's say, a particle in a box, in a two-dimensional box. So what are the posi possible position eigenstates? The posi position eigenstates corresponds to any point x, y, right? But if you want to discretize it, what you do is you take your, your x, y coordinates and draw a grid, right? So you get a finite number of points. And then you describe your position eigenstates as i j, right? i comma j, meaning a point in the grid. 
in terms of this ij states you can you can write down the derivative operators uh, again the form of this derivative operator you can uh, understand very easily if you remember what happens when you discretize uh, when you look at the the derivative of any function so if you remember the first derivative goes like f of x plus delta x minus f of x by delta right the second derivative goes as f of x plus delta x sorry f of x uh, right f of x plus delta x minus 2 f of x plus f of x minus delta right you might not remember that off the top of your head but that's what it is so if you look at this expression that's exactly what this expression is doing right it's taking i plus 1 on this side and i plus 1 here on 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 the other side so so this takes you from ij to one one lattice side behind and this takes you from one lattice side behind to ij right so this is like f x plus delta x and f x minus delta x and this is like minus f x right so you can do this for the x component by looking only at the i indices you can do it for the y component by looking only at the j indices and that gives you the kinetic energy part right so what you do is in in quant is you create a lattice you import quant then you have some helper functions then you define what your what your system is it's a lattice now quant has many helper functions which allow you to create lattices of all different shapes and sizes you don't have to do it manually like honeycomb lattices and so on and so forth here obviously it's a square lattice with side length a is equal to 1 and we define our copying the kinetic energy element t right w and l are the sizes of my lattice then i define my hamiltonian right so how do i do that well i created this object build with builder quant dot builder in this i specify that my lattice lat ij is equal to 4 times t okay so this tells me that my this tells the system that my kinetic energy operator is 4 times t. its magnitude is 4 times t. and then similarly i can define hopping in the y direction so this is ij to ij minus 1 right this is hopping in the y direction because j is the y coordinate and this is hopping in the x direction and i specify what are the associated kinetic energies right then you have a way of attaching uh some leads right because you have a you have a system and you want to measure what quant allows you to do is allows you to measure transport across the system so how do you measure transport you attach some leads which measure a potential so you get a potential difference so you have you do that using these helper functions and then when you build your system it looks like this right so it's 10 by 30 and these are your leads on the left and right hand side and then we uh we can calculate something called the s matrix and using this s matrix we can determine the conductance of the system okay and so this is the conductance and this is the as a function of the energy the t value right so you see something very interesting as a function of the energy the conductance increases in steps the conductance is quantized right so you see this this very quantum phenomenon in a very in a in a simple system right and then there are many more examples here which i which you can explore at your, your leisure there are examples of 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 graphene lattices of superconductors uh 
and all kinds of more advanced uh, topics. Okay. So again, if you want a career in quantum computation or in research which involves quantum technologies, you have to know how to use these uh, these tools. In fact, quant and Q-tip might be outdated by now. I don't know what the latest uh, um, libraries are. There probably are some new libraries which have come out. I haven't looked at it in a while. So again, I'll leave that for you to explore. Okay, and I'll stop here since we have had a two hour long session and take any questions that you might have. And again, uh, this session is not meant to teach you. <laughs> uh, you're not going to learn how to do use these unless you sit down and work through the code on your own. And as I said, the code is available on, on GitHub. Uh, so I'll, I'll share that URL with you. Uh, log in. I'm not logged in into GitHub in a while. So let's log in. Um, Right. So, right. so this is my, my GitHub ID space dash cadet. And you can see uh, all the code that I've upload, uploaded, okay? And uh, there's a bunch of different libraries on tensor networks. All my Jupyter notebooks are there, which contain lots of other things. Uh, so, some of them are just empty shells, which don't really contain any information. Something which I started doing and then never finished, right? Uh, so you can, so for example, I, I looked at, at doing this with Julia also, right? And again, you can, go through these like uh, these notebooks and see if, if you can learn anything of course the best way to learn is to go to these websites of qtip and quant or whichever one and uh, work through their tutorials okay all right questions Any questions? No? All right, then I'll stop the... Is this interface available online or we have to download it? What? Is what available online? Jupyter and... Uh... Yes, of course, of course, all of this is available online. Hmm? Called Anaconda. Okay. So Anaconda is a Python distribution. Right, it, uh, so you just install Anaconda. Okay, you have installers for for all operating systems: Windows, Windows, Linux, Mac, everything, and. Uh, it contains all of this. When you install the Anaconda distribution, it contains Jupyter and everything. Qtip and all you will have to install separately, right? And the way you would install Qtip, for instance, is you use the command called pip. You say pip install Qtip, something like this, right? Or it might be conda install Qtip. Again, you have to, you have to play around with this easily, okay? Any other question? Okay. All right, guys, thanks for coming. I'll stop the live streaming and the